still got three minutes left, I think, so I'll let people come in. And everything I've learned about the InfoSec community, they're not a prop a bunch, you know. <laughs> start okay i think we're gonna go ahead and get going um i guess we just have the stationary mic right so i've got to stay here or project um so there's a guy right there an eye on the back row C can you raise your hand yeah okay good that's just a sound check you know if you can hear me probably anyone can it's because you're furthest away not because you're old and your hearing's becoming feebled or anything um Okay, so I'm gonna uh, talk to you today about Jackson deserialization vulnerabilities. Uh, again, my name is Robert Secord. I'm a technical director at NCC Group. Uh, so mostly what I do for a living is uh, develop and deliver training, uh, secure coding courses in uh, Java, C, C++, and C Sharp. Uh, so this is actually some material I, um, I, I did some research on last year uh, and then sort of incorporated this into uh, some of our Java training. Um, so when I'm not uh, doing training development, I'm doing some, uh, you know, secure coding research and a lot of this stuff kind of folds in. Uh, I'm actually a member of the C standards committee, so um, I'm more, uh, you know, kind of funny story, but I, I was on the C standards committee for the entire C11 project. So uh, if you ever wondered who was responsible for that garbage, uh, you could probably blame me or throw hopefully soft objects. <laughs> um, yeah, nothing, yeah, nothing that would leave a dent. Um, and uh, I also do some consulting. Uh, typically I'll do a lot of, uh, you know, source, uh, source code analysis for customers, uh, you know, uh, uh, source code aided uh, uh, security testing. So, uh, and, and I think we, can we take questions as we go along or do you have a, like to wait till the end? Yeah, so if you have a question, just go ahead and ask a question. Uh, I, 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 hopefully, I kind of designed this talk to fit the available time so it you know, shouldn't uh, run over. Um, so Jackson uh, so Jackson's basically a JSON for uh, Java. So it supports the data binding capability that um, you know, supports data binding and object serialization. Basically, allows you to uh, serialize 
uh, Java objects into JSON strings and then deserialize JSON strings back into Java objects. So it's back, uh, you know, sort of a converter between uh, JSON and, uh, and Java objects. And, and it's, uh, it's quite popular. It's the most popular package for doing this. Um, so this is, again, part of a, I have actually an entire day on Java serialization. So this is part of that material. And uh, when I put together an entire day on that and I was finished, I thought, uh, you know, maybe I screwed up here. I'm not sure anyone's going to want to listen to this for an entire day. But it actually turned into a, a kind of a popular uh, module of the course. Uh, so the way Jackson deserialization works um, is that you define or identify a Java class corresponding to the JSON. So that's already taking the perspective that you're starting with deserialization. Of course, you know, uh, another typical scenario is to have a Java object which you serialize and then you would then just deserialize that object back to this, you know, that string back to the same object. Uh, but if you're starting with the JSON, you would uh, define or identify a Java class for that JSON. And then uh, you create an instance of this um, Jackson class called object mapper. And an object mapper is actually a bit simpler than uh, Java serialization, Object Mapper does uh, serialization and deserialization for you, and you basically just create one instance of this thing and keep it around the entire time. Uh, so Object Mapper has a read value <coughs> method, so you could call uh, read value, and that will then uh, read in uh, a JSON object from a file, input stream, string, or byte array. Uh, and again, it's a, it's a thread safe service class, so you can uh, instantiate it once and just keep it around for your whole application. And really, you want to do that because the startup time for this object is, uh, is pretty expensive. Uh, so Object Mapper, again, converts between the Java objects and the corresponding JSON uh, strings. Uh, it has functionality to read and write JSON to and from uh, plain old uh, Java objects. So it uses the JSON parser and JSON generator for reading and writing JSON. And it's uh, highly customizable to work with different styles of JSON content uh, and to support uh, more advanced concepts such as polymorphism and object identity. And uh, I'll say something quickly about this. Um, so as a member of the C Standards Committee, we have a, a principle which is conservation mechanism, right? And so the idea is uh, try to only provide one way to do things, right? Don't try to provide three or four or five different ways to do the same thing. Um, and that is not a principle which was uh, greatly entertained by the authors of the Jackson package, right? So they, they sort of had the opposite view of uh, let's provide all sorts of different kind of ways to do things uh, and sort of this way uh, programmers can decide, you know, what style they like or, you know, which flavor, or which interface. And, you know, so there's just a lot of ways to do things. And, and what's the reason the C committee doesn't do that, and I would recommend against it, is that um, you, you, you create all sorts of combinatorics, right? So, so you, you have to start wondering things like, well, what happens if I use you know, this approach to do this part of the process and then a different approach to do this other part of the process? You know, what if I combine things in different ways? Uh, and you have to test all of those things for what sort of uh, odd behavior might uh, come out of that. Uh, but basically, it's... Uh, there's a lot of complexity to this uh, API, and um, uh, no one really knows how it works. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, and, and the way it evolved was the guy writing it didn't know how it worked, right? So he would write it and would say, oh, that's not quite right, let me tweak it. And, uh, oh, that's a little better, let me tweak it some more, right? So it was, a, it was sort of a, a process of uh, discovery. Um, so just to look at some code, uh, if you want to construct objects, again, you create instances of this object mapper, uh, and th then we're creating a, a new object that's just a random object that you're going to serialize and deserialize. In this case, we're going to serialize it to a file uh, called serializationdata.json. Uh, and to serialize it, it's really just as simple as calling the write value method on this mapper object and giving it the, the name, you know, the file uh, identifier and uh, the, you know, value of the object that you want to uh, serialize. And then to deserialize it, you just call read value uh, and, you know, again, specify the file identifier and the name of the class that you're deserializing to. Uh, and, of course, uh, you can use this to deserialize any type of object, so it just returns an object, right, generic object, and then you uh, cast it or assign it to whatever uh, type of object you're actually uh, creating. 
So again, I mentioned, uh, you know, so, so think about the process of uh, deserializing a JSON string. Uh, you've got, you know, a collection of, uh, uh, you know, objects and each object has a set of properties. And so when you create a class, you're gonna have a class with a bunch of corresponding fields. And so what, what the JSON deserialization process has to do is it has to take each, uh, each property it finds in the JSON and uh, basically call a setter method uh, in the class. Well, first of all, it has to figure out what class it is and call a constructor for that class. Uh, then it has to take each property and call a setter method in order to take the data from the JSON object and uh, set it in the, um, in the object. So there's a lot of code that's executing as the, uh, part of the process of deserializing uh, one of these JSON strings. Uh, and again, the process of doing this is uh, non-trivial and it's constantly evolving. Uh, and you know, what the, the author of this package is trying to do is make it you know, as the least surprising interface as possible. <laughs> so they're trying to create this so it seems intuitive. Uh, but you know, what's intuitive at one level is sort of complex at a more detailed level. Um, so the simplest way to make a field in your class, both serializable and deserializable, is just to make it public. Uh, if you don't want to make it public, because generally speaking, that's bad software engineering practice, um, you can have getters. So non-public, uh, getters will make non-public fields serializable. Uh, and that, that makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, it, it will also make private fields deserializable. Uh, because once you have a getter for it, it's now considered a property by uh, Jackson uh, because it has a beha it has a getter, and so it now becomes deserializable. Uh, and setters will also mark non-public fields as deserializable. So there's uh, there's some automatic uh, so public getters and setters uh, are detected uh, again regardless of accessibility. Uh, and, and there's a, so, a certain amount of automatic detection that Jackson does for the class. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the secret sauce in all these serialization, deserialization mechanisms is reflection. You know, it's, it's kind of the secret sauce behind Java, right? They, uh, the way they get away with not introducing new keywords and things like this is they, uh, they write reflection uh, routines that will look for methods with certain signatures and then give those methods, you know, special properties. Um, so, um, so non-public fields can be accessed by uh, non-private getters, so just any getter uh, property with a matching name, and also single argument constructors are automatically detected if they uh, use one of these sort of, uh, um, uh, I don't know how to describe these types, basic type string, boolean, integer, and long. Uh, and also uh, static single value arguments of value of methods are automatically detected. So uh, if you don't want to rely on the magic of automatic detection, and some of that stuff is sort of legacy <laughs> mechanisms that have just been around for a while and wouldn't be included today if um, you know, they were starting over from scratch. So uh, you can also explicitly uh, provide annotations and those will take precedence over uh, automatically detected properties. So you can use a JSON property, which will indicate that a property is to be included uh, JSON any setter would take a two argument method and use it for uh, deserializing just sort of arbitrary properties for which there are no matching getters or setters available. Uh, and JSON creator can be used to indicate that a method is a constructor for that object. Again, Jackson's gonna have to call a constructor of some kind in order to create that object. Uh, or it might be that you have a static factory method, which is uh, you know, not a constructor, but uh, used in that uh, pattern to uh, instantiate objects. So you can use JSON to creator to indicate that static, static factory method is the correct mechanism to use to uh, you know, instantiate new instances of that object. Uh, and JSON setter is an alt, uh, alternative to JSON property for marking methods as setters. Uh, so I mentioned polymorphic type handling. Um, it's a uh, probably the fanciest phrase I use in the talk. Um, but basically, um, this supports two things. It supports Java inheritance, uh, and it supports non-concrete uh, non types such as abstract classes interfaces. And so without polymorphic type handling, uh, the deserialization mechanism uh, wouldn't be able to differentiate between 
uh, two subclasses of a superclass, and so it would wind up uh, instantiating an object of the superclass, which means that you know, if I, take a, uh, if I take some objects and I serialize them and then I deserialize them, I could wind up with something different, right? And that's not really a property you want from your serialization, deserialization. You wanna, you wanna go full, uh, full circle and end up with what you started out with. Um, and so basically polymorphic type handling is required in order to correctly deserialize uh, the object chain. So people tend to enable this, right? I mean, so basically you have this turned off, your deserialization fails, you turn this on, deserialization works, everything's great. Uh, the problem is that, um, so polymorphic type handling requires embedding type information into the JSON representations so that those objects can be uh, correctly restored. And again, because Jackson likes to do everything for everyone, there's several different mechanisms they use for embedding the type information into the object. And, and it doesn't, doesn't really matter to this, uh, uh, to this lecture about, or this talk, what mechanism you use. Uh, but basically, um, this has to be enabled to, to sort of allow a correct uh, deserialization. And the enabling of this feature, which is what then makes your, uh, your JSON vulnerable to exploits. Um, and, and so you'll, you'll hear people try to, well, you'll hear people say that by default, uh, Jackson is secure, uh, and that's correct. Without enabling this feature, you can't uh, accomplish these exploits, but everyone enables this feature because it's necessary to do sort of correct deserialization of, of Java objects. Uh, so, you know, the, the reassurance that it's secure by default is very misleading. It's actually uh, more problematic than that. So again, Jackson being Jackson, it supports multiple mechanisms for uh, providing type information. Um, the easiest way to do it is uh, via that object mapper class that we looked at. You can just call uh, enable default typing. Uh, you can also build a custom type resolver builder. I don't talk about that one much. I don't think uh, I've ever seen anyone do that. I think that's basically a mechanism you use if you want to sort of rewrite the entire way you uh, you handle the process. So it's not that uh, frequently used. Uh, and the other option is locally using uh, JSON type info annotations, another set of annotations. So the simplest uh, and also, of course, the least secure uh, is to use the default typing. Uh, so uh, you have your object mapper object, uh, again, that supports serialization, deserialization, and you can just call mapper enable default typing and boom, you're done, right? So it's the easiest thing to do, uh, but it's, it's also what makes your system completely insecure. Um, and so, uh, you know, the author of this package, uh, as well as, uh, uh, as me, both, both suspect this is done a lot, right? Because what happens is, you know, you deserialize, you get some error messages, uh, you, uh, you do Google, you wind up in a Stack Overflow, right? And then <laughs> there's a little Stack Overflow article that says, oh, get rid of that problem by calling enable default typing. Uh, you type that in, your problems go away, you know, uh, and then you do WQ exclamation mark shift, right? Does anyone, the old guy knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, and so there's also some arguments you can use to uh, limit the effects of this. Uh, for example, just to apply it to non-final non objects, which you know is really all you need it for, but doesn't uh, limit it, limiting uh, the call in that way doesn't eliminate the uh, vulnerabilities here. So for things to be exploitable, step one is the serialization of untrusted JSON data. Uh, and whenever I talk about any mitigations for any of this stuff, uh, you know, all the security people in my company always say, you know, tell them never <laughs> deserialize untrusted data. So that's, that's rule number one, just don't deserialize untrusted data. Uh, but, it, you know, every time I say that to an audience, they say, but, but we have to. <laughs> that's our whole architecture, you know. So, so people do seem to need to do this, and so uh, that's, you know, uh, there are ways to try to secure this, right? But of course, uh, step one is, you know, I mean, basically, uh, there's a certain amount of risk of taking a gun, holding it to your head, and pulling the trigger, right? But if you absolutely need to do that, okay, we can talk about ways to 
try to reduce the risk. <laughs> this is where this is going from there. Okay, so don't deserialize on trusted data. Um, so the specific uh, gadget class uh, that's used in the exploit has to be accessible from the vulnerable JVM. And I didn't talk about uh, a lot about gadget classes, mm -hmm. but but the, the the basic exploit here is that uh, you are expecting a certain uh, object, a certain class to deserialize. But what happens is the the attacker supplies you with a bunch of other objects, right? And so you go to deserialize it. You call your read value method, and until that read value method returns you don't know what sort of objects are being deserialized. Uh, so basically the attacker supplies a bunch of objects uh, with a bunch of uh, JSON uh, objects with a bunch of properties, right? And so as those objects are deserialized, uh, it's going to execute code in your JVM and it's gonna execute that code with value supplied by the attacker. So basically deserializing untrusted uh, data is equivalent to having the attacker tell you what code they want you to run with what specific data value. And so it turns out there are some very interesting classes uh, which um, you know, can do some fun things. Uh, some, some classes, you know, for example, you can package with arbitrary bytecode that gets executed when they're deserialized, right? So that's obviously problematic, but there's a, a variety of other gadgets as well. And so the gadgets, um, you know, the code that they're, be, that they're asking you to execute is they're not providing it. It has to be present in your JVM. But you don't actually have to be using that functionality. It just has to be in a class which is loadable by your JVM, right? So any, any class in any library that's in the, you know, uh, the class path for your JVM that can be, uh, you know, loaded by the boot class loader and execute it can be part of this exploit. So for example, you know, if you just happen to have old libraries sitting around in your class path, uh, that becomes a risk because uh, the attacker could uh, instantiate, uh, you know, objects for those classes. Uh, so third thing, again, is that uh, you have to have a polymorphic uh, type handling enabled. And the, the one thing, you know, one thing that's better about Jackson than, say, just Java serialization is that you can specify the root class to which you want to serialize. And if the root class is spe uh, specific enough, it's gonna prevent you from uh, deserializing a wide array of objects. Uh, but it is very, very common <laughs> to have a type of Java lang object as your root type, which means again that you can deserialize anything because everything in Java is an object. Uh, so including the complete you know, set of gadgets that are available. Um, and the reason, you know, one reason that's common is a lot of times people will write a method, right, to handle their deserialization, uh, and they'll generalize that method to work for, uh, you know, all the times they deserialize within their system. And so for that method to work with everything, it has to deserialize to an object type, right? Otherwise, uh, well, I guess it could be passed as an, uh, as a, as an argument, but it is quite common for people to do this. Uh, the other thing that would work is that you could use a permissive tag interface. So for example, uh, anything which uh, implements serializable or comparable. And if, if you were to use an interface like that, it's broad enough that there's gonna be a wide selection of gadgets that an attacker could uh, then deserialize. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, so, so Jackson's mitigation for these attacks is to try to apply a deny list or a blacklist and um, so if you, um, you know, if you have a recent version of Jackson and the particular gadget you're trying to serialize has been blacklisted, that won't succeed. Uh, but um, deny list or blacklist are really uh, not a particularly effective uh, solution and we'll talk more about that. Okay, so I have a demonstration. And I have two versions of this. Uh, I might just do one, because it's just the same two ways, but one uses um, uh, a vulnerable version of uh, Zalon that's built into the JRE. Uh, that exploit only works with Java 8, 4, 5, and earlier versions. And the reason I'm saying that out loud is because when I do the demo, I always forget to set the version so it fails the first time, and then you'll say, but Robert, you forgot to set the, and oh, right, and I'll fix it. Uh, and um, 
It also works with the current pr uh, version of the Apache Xeon, right, which is a separate library that has to be installed. But, you know, attacking gadgets that are part of the JRE are great because they absolutely have to be there. Um, let me go ahead and show this. And I called this Jackson Cage because it was a, a Bruce Springsteen song that no one seems to remember anymore. Does anybody remember the Jackson? Nobody. You do. Somebody. <laughs> One person. Wow. Um, okay, so let's, let's see if I can demo this. Um, usually what I do is I, I set up a bunch of breakpoints and stuff at strategic places because I'm old enough now that I can't. What's that? Oh, it is duplicate, right? Yeah, otherwise you wouldn't see it on the screen. Well, it's not come up for a while. All right. That's the only way to do it. Um, so this might not be part of the recording? Yeah. Okay. I'll, um, I'll try to be very descriptive. So, yeah, so, uh, so here, see what we're doing. Okay, so down here you can see we're using JDK 18040, so that's a vulnerable version of the JDK, so we've got past the step where I mess up already, so that's good. Okay, so here um, we're setting a property, and uh, this is just um, for whether or not I want to use the, J the version of Xelon that's built into JRE or use the uh, library version. And my interface here is so good that I can never remember what upstream means if it means <laughs> the library version. I think uh, upstream means the library version, so this will test the built-in JRE version. And so we're gonna create this uh, uh, remote command execution payload. So I'm gonna step into that. And uh, our payload's gonna be calculator because that's mandatory. Um, I gave a talk in Boston a couple years ago, and at the end of the talk, the guy says, well, one of the people asked a question, they said, well, okay, so you can execute a calculator, but what's the risk to me and my system? And I'm like, people can run arbitrary code in your systems. I'm like, hmm, so how's that a vulnerability? And, and, and at some point, I just started stammering, and I had to get like help from the audience to explain to him why you don't want random people in the world running executables on your system. But you all get that, right? It's not, not good. <laughs> um, so we're gonna, you know, pop up the calculator and let me continue. So we're gonna use um, this uh, temples implet. Uh, let me step into this. And you can see here that we're going to, uh, based on the property setting, uh, we might either use the Apache version or the built-in version. Again, I think what we're doing here is we're using the, uh, the built-in uh, JRE version of this. Let me step into this further. So we're gonna create this temple implet. So we're gonna um, create basically these gadget objects. So this is going to involve uh, something known as a, a translit. Uh, which has this interesting property of basically, uh, it, it's an existing class uh, that lets you um, uh, compile Java into bytecodes and install it as a property in that class and that property will get invoked during the Jackson deserialization property. So, let me continue. Oh, so here we're just creating the JSON uh, so one thing that makes JSON attacks a, a little bit harder than uh, Java attacks is that for, for Java deserialization vulnerabilities, you can just serialize your object and then when you deserialize it, it will, um, it will execute the exploit. But that doesn't work with Jackson because when you, when you serialize the Jackson object, it actually runs the exploit. So that's sort of the attacker sort of self-owning themselves, right? So what you have to do is you have to hand craft the strings. You have to do the serialization process manually to avoid triggering the exploit uh, during the serialization process. So that's what we just did with those uh, string routines. Um, oh, and so here is the line. See this uh, make class initializer insert after? 
you can see that we're, we're giving it some source code, some Java source code. And the Java source code um, does the simplest thing imaginable. It just invokes uh, runtime get runtime exec to execute uh, the contents of a string. And so the string we're passing here is the, the calc.exe, we pass it as an argument. You can, of course, pass a string with an arbitrary number of uh, arguments to it if you uh, need a little bit more sophisticated, uh, you know, um, exploit string. And now, next we're going to, uh, we're going to convert that to bytecode and inject it into the object. And then we do some uh, reflective setting of these fields and we return this, uh, this object that we've created, the serialized object with sort of this uh, uh, built-in surprise for when you deserialize it. Okay. So here again is the RCE payload. Uh, we're going to uh, do some more sort of configurations. We're going to uh, write the string to this translate bytecodes. Then we put it in output properties. And output properties is the specific property that gets invoked when we deserialize this object. And I just pushed down on the, uh, the button and forwarded a bunch of things. I think that's OK. <coughs> um, and so I'll, I'll make this one point. Uh, maybe it'll come up again when I deserialize. But the, the, the property we're actually, uh, that's going to get run is in, a, um, is in a getter method. And to me, that was surprising in itself, right? Because during the serialization process, you're reading in the JSON object and the properties, and you're taking the data from the property, and you should be calling a setter, right, in order to uh, put that information from the, the JSON property into the object field. Uh, but it turns out that this process is un you know, unintuitive. And so uh, there are a bunch of getters and things which are called also. Uh, frequently just because Jackson's trying to figure out the structure of your objects. So a lot of objects have sub uh, references to other objects that need to be instantiated. And so um, Jackson will call these getter methods. And that's actually, you know, again here, a surprise. And, and, and we all know that, you know, security and surprises are uh, problematic. So here's, um, See if I can make sure we can see this. Okay, so here's the uh, the JSON string, and it's kind of hard to look at because it's just encoded bytecodes, right? So you've got a weird looking uh, string here, but you can see this output properties uh, um, getter, which is going to be um, invoked as part of the deserialization process. So here's the deserialization, and the next step. So uh, let me try to step into this and see if we can get anything interesting out of that. So we're going to create a new <coughs> object mapper. That's the object that does all the serialization, deserialization. Uh, next, we do the uh, see, and you see how slow that is. That's why you only want to create one of these. And then you you can see this next step. We do the very dangerous thing that uh, uh, enables polymorphic type handling and also uh, allows for uh, these exploits to succeed. And now we're going to call read value, and then we, uh, on this read value line, we do the one, uh, the one final thing that's necessary for this exploit to work, which is that we deserialize to a very general class, such as object, uh, which will allow us to deserialize that, um, that Zalon uh, gadget that we just created. Uh, so that's all the, all the problems that we need to make this exploit succeed. Let me step into this again. Maybe I'll just hit continue. I think I've got some breakpoints. Okay, so we're about to call a getter method. And again, you probably wouldn't have thought that at the beginning of this talk that you would call a getter method during deserialization. That came as a surprise to me as well. Um, let me see if I can step into that. I, I've got a feeling this next step is going to trigger the, yeah. So, so calling that getter method triggers the exploit. We deserialize the calculator. Uh, this works just fine, um, and that's most of the demo. Let me see if I can just wrap up here and get out. Uh, th these will, I believe, throw an exception, uh, which is uh, unfortunate from the attacker perspective. Uh, with, with the Java deserialization, you can, 
uh, you can deserialize the vulnerability without getting any sort of exception. Uh, but there, there'll be some uh, indication that this attack has occurred. And yeah, so you'll see an exception there. So that's the end of that demo. Any questions on the demo before I put that away? We're kind of a quiet bunch. I mean, uh, people are paying attention. I do see nods at the right time and all that. Um, okay. And um, I'm gonna skip the part where I show that with the, the external library version. But again, the current version of the Apache library is still vulnerable today, as far as I know. Uh, so all you need, again, is that thing to be sitting on your path. You don't need to even use it, right? So that's just a good reason in general to clean up your, <laughs> your directories and make sure you don't have old files sitting around that you're not, uh, not using for any reason. So again, the primary mitigation for this is just to never deserialize untrusted data. Um, I mean, all, and there's a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm talking about Jackson, I've talked a little bit about Java deserialization. There's, um, you know, all sorts of deserialization libraries out there for C Sharp and uh, other languages, and they all pretty much have this problem, you know? And the basic problem here is that your allowing an attacker to specify code that they, that they want you, know, you to execute for them with data value supplied by the attacker. So basically, the, the problem of deserialization is, is the problem of uh, executing attacker-supplied code in your system, and that's probably the toughest problem in security to solve. So uh, deserialization is a very uh, problematic class of vulnerabilities in general. Um, so JASN has a blacklist of known gadget types. That is not particularly effective. i uh, have a good demo of that in a second. Um, another mitigation strategy is to eliminate polymorphic type handling uh, using the names of the classes. So you can actually use other things besides the names of the classes, and if you don't use the names, then uh, that sort of breaks the generic mechanism that an attacker would use. Uh, and then again, you want to specify the specific type of the expected root object and not something very general like object class or permissive uh, tag interface. Okay, so here's the Jackson uh, blacklist. Uh, so there's a list of known gadgets, right? And, and the first thing I can tell you about this list of gadgets is, that, is I've seen bigger lists of gadgets, <laughs> right? So uh, to me, that means that that list is not exhaustive, right? There's other known gadgets that, that haven't been included here. Um, the second problem with um, gadgets uh, can sort of be shown on this chart, right? So, well, I better stay here, I'm gonna lose the mic. Um, so at the bottom there, the number five, that's the original vulnerability that reported this. And so the fix was to add this blacklist. And so the, the one, uh, number four, uh, second from the bottom, basically says, oh, here's a gadget that you missed I'm putting on the blacklist. So that was then added. And the number three says, here's another gadget that you forgot to put in the blacklist. And number two says, here's another gadget you forgot to put in the blacklist. And uh, number one does the same thing, right? And that's the inherent problem with these blacklists. Um, uh, you know, blacklists can succeed when you have an innumerable set of things to defend against, right? And the problem here is that this, there's no innumerable set of uh, vulnerable gadgets. There's basically an infinite number of them. Uh, and, you know, they're only including the ones I know. Now, on the other hand, um, if you are the Jackson library person, this is the best you can do, right? So, so a better solution, obviously, to whitelist, but as a library writer, you don't know <laughs> what sort of objects your uh, users are going to deserialize, so the best you can do as a library writer is to create one of these uh, deny lists. Um, so type information can also be provided using uh, Jackson polymorphic type handling annotations. So instead of just turning it on for everything, uh, which is going to enable this type of tax, you just turn it on for the things that need it. So uh, JSON type info indicates uh, details of what type information is included in serialization. Uh, JSON subtypes indicate subtypes of uh, annotated type. And JSON type name defines a logical type name. And so the logical type name that you define can be used instead of the class name. And that's again a mechanism to prevent uh, deserialization. And so, um, so there's, uh, 
you know, th there's sort of four prerequisites for deserialization attack to work, right? And so the mitigations, uh, and I've gone through these already, are to uh, eliminate, <laughs> take those away, right? Uh, break those preconditions. And theoretically, if you eliminate any one of them, it will prevent deserialization attacks, but I'm a little more paranoid than that. So, so I'd recommend strongly, you know, apply all the mitigations. Because uh, you never know down the road when someone might find a bypass for one of the mitigations you thought were going to prevent it. So theoretically, uh, just having one should do, but I recommend using them all. And so again, one of the mitigations is don't use the class name by default. Uh, use JSON type name to indicate a specific logical name for that object that you know and the attacker doesn't know. Uh, so I'm going to show another quick demo. Uh, and this demo is, is not an exploit. This is just a kind of a demo of using uh, polymorphic type annotations in order to secure your system. And wow, the resolution for this is so, so bad. So I'm going to demonstrate this using Java 11 because I worked on this last night in my hotel room and got it working. And I'm that stupid that I think something I just got working last night is going to work when I show it today. <laughs> um, <coughs> okay. So, and, and this is not this is not exciting. Uh, you know, not, no calculator is going to pop up. This is just trying to show you how to do this in a uh, secure manner. Uh, so we have, uh, we create a zoo object. Uh, we create some animals to put in our zoo. We create a list of the animals in the zoo. And then we add uh, each of these animals. Uh, then we go ahead and uh, serialize that, deserialize that. And if I ran it, it, it should work, but it's just going to say, hey, we've serialized and deserialized. Uh, let me skip the zoo and go right to the animal class. So the animal class is where we add the typing information. And again, this whole polymorphic type thing is because without it, um, the deserialization isn't going to be a recognized subtype. So it's just going to have to instantiate a bunch of animals. It's not going to be able to instantiate uh, lions and, uh, I was going to say pigs, but you don't really have pigs in zoos. I guess you have uh, maybe warthogs or something. But, um, and so here, uh, we have a JSON type info annotation. Uh, one of the things we do is we say, um, by default, it's going to use the class name. We don't want to use the default. We want to specify a name. So we're going to say we're going to identify this object by name. Um, and so for the subtypes here, and this is in the animal class, we have to say that uh, lion is going to be a subclass of animal, uh, and also elephant uh, is going to be a subclass of animal, and we specify the names for each of those objects. Uh, and then we go ahead and um, in the super class, the animal class, we specify uh, which of the fields in this class are going to be properties uh, of the object. So that's basically all you need to do. Uh, I could pop up also one of these subclasses. Let's look at lion. And lion, I don't believe, has really much in the way of annotations. Okay, so you, you'll see some annotations here, but these annotations are just to uh, identify additional fields in this subclass of properties of this object that are, that are going to be serialized and deserialized and things like JSON creator. So one of, one of the flaws with this, um, anyone here see what the flaw is with this? Because I, I assume you're mostly security people and not some, how many people here are developers? Okay, so you guys should be able to spot the flaw here. <laughs> okay, so there, there's, really this implementation violates basic, um, uh, object-oriented programming principles in that when you write a superclass, the idea is that you don't know uh, how that's going to be used. So users of your superclass are going to subclass that for different classes of animals. You don't know a priori all the animals that your zoo is going to have. But to use this mechanism, 
you actually have to put into the supertype the names of all the subtypes that you're going to create. So that sort of pre-limits this as to how extensible it is. So it means you can only sort of use this yourself. You can't package this in a library and have someone else uh, subclass this because they're not going to have the source code to modify the, uh, the library code. So it is, um, it's not, a, you know, there's a violation of a basic, pr basic principle here, but, uh, you know, you sort of need to do something like this in order to make it secure. So the author of the package told me they also have a dynamic uh, methods that you can use to supply the type information. So instead of doing it using annotations, you can do it uh, by invoking methods at runtime, and that ought to support, um, you know, the uh, uh, general inheritance if you uh, need to do that. Uh, but again, it's all it's all a little bit half-ass. It's not <laughs> it's not uh, you know. Uh, really well architected the security solution here. Um, so I'm just about done. I think I've got a summary slide, and then we've got a few minutes left if there are any questions. Uh, so so the, the author of the Jackson package, um, I can't remember his name. I think he's got some cow, cow something in his, his alias. <laughs> Um, which is funny because that's in the news lately too, with uh, Nunes's cow. Anyone here read the news? <laughs> 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 um, so anyway, he he was a pretty nice guy, and because he was a nice guy, I use this line that says, "Poorly written Java code that deserializes JSON strung, uh, strings from untrusted sources can be vulnerable to a, a, a range of exploits." So what I've done with that line is I blame the user. <laughs> of his package instead of blaming him for writing a, a package which was easily misused to create vulnerabilities. And this is, this sort of language is familiar to me from my years on the C standards committee where, you know, they never did anything wrong. Uh, people just calling, you know, get S incorrectly. <laughs> Basically is their position. <laughs> um, so, uh, so again, uh, this can be used to do remote uh, command execution, which we demonstrated. Um, I've never seen a paper uh, on using this for denial of service attack. Uh, I haven't demonstrated it. Uh, both the author of this package and myself think this is trivially done. It just takes a little bit of work because um, you have to hand code the strings. You can't just deserialize the attack. And uh, you know, it's easier to try things out with uh, Java deserialization exploits than it is with uh, these Jackson ones. These take a little bit more work. So one day when I'm uh, board, I guess I'll, I'll try to create a uh, sample POC for that. Um, and then, you know, very broadly, uh, deserialization vulnerabilities can really exploit any functionality in any of the classes that are deserializing. So sometimes it's very trivial things. Sometimes you just have a, you know, a setter or getter method which deletes a file, right? And so what the attacker would do would use that uh, deserialization method to delete an arbitrary file on your file system. Right, so, so those basically, and this is why you can't enumerate all the dangerous classes, right? Any functionality that's executed as part of deserializing any class might be part of an exploit. Um, and so, again, these attacks are possible when the Java class name is used um, and uh, the resulting uh, object is deserialized to a very uh, general class such as object or uh, serializable or something like this. Uh, so that's all I have. I can take questions. This is me. That's how you get in touch with me. I answer email 724. You can email me at 3 uh, in the morning on a Tuesday night and I'll answer you within five minutes because I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, any questions? I mean, that'll, you know, yeah, pretty much work anywhere. I mean, the only part of that that's plat platform specific is the name of the command <laughs> you want to execute, right? I mean, calc will work on Windows, or, you know, uh, you, you want to invoke some sort of remote shell or whatever your, your exploit is for a different platform. Right, so you can, you can use this to execute both. Yeah, 
whatever community you like. They're all great. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah, anything. Uh, okay, uh, any other questions? Oh, so, so as a security researcher, how do you discover these things? Um, you know, I, I mean, so I, I guess the first thing I should do is not take a lot of credit for this, right? So, uh, so I wasn't the original person who identified a lot of these issues. I, 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 think, I think what I do a lot is sort of my contribution to the field is, um, you know, I, I sort of take things and I, I work them out in more detail and sort of give them more of a, you know, uh, engineering <laughs> discipline explanation to them. Um, but stuff like this, you know, it, uh, it, it's generally suspicious, right? I mean, when you're, uh, if you're familiar with some sort of deserialization, you start to realize that code is running, and then eventually you have the thought, I wonder if that can be used in an attack, and then you just have to kind of think it through, what, what might this be? and then people stumble upon these gadgets. And that's what people do, a lot of researchers do now is they look for new gadgets. And, and that's not terribly exciting to me because I, I'm assuming there's a limited number of gadgets and you know the solution is not to blacklist because that can never end up that way. Um, uh, you know, another story I tell, in SeaWorld, there's the uh, format output vulnerability, percent N, where you can execute a format string and, and execute arbitrary code in your C process. And that was discovered in 2000, but um, you know, no one on the C committee knew Blink when that came out because they knew that feature <laughs> since the 70s. In fact, that feature was interpreted in Fortran. Um, and, and that's, uh, you know, there's a free vulnerability if you want it. Uh, go back and look at Fortran. No one's talked about format output <laughs> vulnerability in Fortran, but I'm sure it's there. Okay, I think we're probably out of time, so thank you very much, everyone.